All right, hi everybody, I'm Matt uh, McPherson. You guys all know me. I've been here for about three years. Um, I'm doing this class today because I'm also a certified appraiser. I've been an appraiser for about a decade now. So that's been my main thing for a long time. I've had my own appraisal firm for about seven years and it's still you know, going. So you know, I've been doing this for a while. So Brian asked me to teach a class today on just how appraisals work and, and kind of the stuff that you guys might not know that might help you in, in your transactions. Um, what most of the time people ask me about is comps and how to select comps and what to, what to actually look for in comps. And most of the time, you know, the standard is you want to go back 90 days at the most six months. Typically, you want to stay within 20% of the square footage. Now, what I always do when uh, I'm looking for comps, I usually go out to about 25% because there might be a comp that say, you know, one foot larger than 20% and it could be the comp that makes your deal make sense. So always go out a little bigger, but you don't, you, you want to put more emphasis on the ones that are within 20%, but it's always good to see everything that's out there to get into that. Um, a lot of times what happens is, and I know most of you guys have dealt with this before, you get to a property, there's something funky about it. It's near a railroad track, it's on a busy street, it backs a commercial property, or th there's some factor in it that makes it either better or worse, okay? And the one thing you always want to do when you have a, a, a factor like that is you need to find another like comparable, okay? So if you're on a traffic street and you're going to go meet the appraiser or you're doing your CMA, you want to make sure that you have at least one comp with a traffic street, with, with the same influence. The appraisers call that bracketing. So you want to make sure that you have all your significant features bracketed. So if you're on, if you have a view, you want to make sure you have some comps with views. You know, the good and the bad. Same with if all your comps have pools and you don't have a pool, you want to find a comp without a pool because that's going to be a better indicator of market value than you know everything else. So you want to find things that are common to you. Sometimes what happens though is you go back six months and you're looking for say, and the most common one is you're on a traffic street. Okay, you got it. If you can't find anything within six months, within 20% square footage on a traffic street, you got to go, okay, what's going to be the most common? Well, you know that if you went back nine months, the market's been going up. So you can kind of extrapolate going, well, the market's gone up, say, you know, five, 10% and you find a comp that's on a traffic street from say nine months ago. That'd probably be one of your better, you need one of those for the appraiser because the appraiser is going to need to find them. You know, so you want to at least be able to show the appraiser, hey, I've done my due diligence. I know what I'm doing. Here's a bracket comp for the traffic, you know, that kind of thing. And the bracket comps can be a little different. They don't always have to be within 20%, you know, because you're basically using that to find your unique factor for your property. So the rule of thumb, usually I just I would just from now on do 21 to 22 percent, just so you get that little extra. Six months, you got to have at least two comps within 90 days. Have to. Um, if you can't, you better have a good reason why. You know, um, if you're in a condo and nothing's sold in there in the past year, okay, that then you know that you're going to need to find other like comparables and other condos within 90 days. So you got to have at least two within 90 days. Appraisers always need at least four closed sales, okay? Um, and they do that for a reason because if you find one comp at 800,000 and everything else is at seven, well, that 800,000 is the anomaly. And if you're saying you're as good as that eight, you need to have a reason why, you know? And if you do have one of those properties that's going to be selling more than anybody else out there, you need to do the best homework you can so when you meet the appraiser, you can give them a laundry list of upgrades. Here's everything that's been done on the home. Don't go in and say, well, it's nice, it's got this, it's got that. Itemize it. Because the appraiser, the appraiser always wants to make the deal work because if he doesn't, 
He's going to get loan officers emailing him, appraisal departments emailing him, agents pissed off, buyers pissed off. So they want to make it work, but they have to stay within their guidelines. And because if they overinflate something, they could lose their license, get sued, blacklisted. There's a lot of things. So they can't just shit out a number. I couldn't think of another word. But, you know, they need proof. So the more things that you can bring to the table for the appraiser, it always will help your cause. Don't expect the appraiser to know all these things by just walking in the home. Um, and that's ma mainly comp selection. Does anyone have, have any questions on how to select your comps? Or? Matt, if I've got a pool, should all my comps have pools? No. You need to have at least one with a pool. It's better the more you have, the better it is. But you need to have at least one with a pool because Pools are one of those things where it, they do add value for a lot of people, but a lot of times they don't. Because a lot of people go, oh, I don't want a pool. I don't want to deal with that. And that's why I always tell people when they're like buying a house or they're refinancing, they're like, oh yeah, I'm taking out 80 grand to build a pool. And the first question, are you ever going to move? If they say, yeah, we're moving in five, 10 years. Don't build a pool. Because you're never going to get the money back out of the pool. What's up? Usually between, between 10 and 30 grand. Usually my default is about 10 grand for a pool and 5,000 for an in-ground spa. Above ground spo uh, spas carry no value. They're just because the seller can take it with them. Most don't, but they can. So it's considered personal property. The pool and a spa, about 15 grand. But once you get, say you're at an, in an area where things are selling for $600, $700 a square foot, that pool is typically going to be a lot nicer. So then you'd probably be in the $30,000 to $40,000 range. But you usually won't see adjustments over that amount. What's up, John? Uh, what happens if you have a uh, garage that's been converted to like a really nice granite kitchen and lots of upgrades? How do you factor that in? Is it permitted? No, um, basically with that, converted garages, things like that, there's an intrinsic value to, to them where most buyers walk in and go, well, that's pretty cool. But there's also the flip side of that is most people go, well, if it's not permitted, what happens when the city comes and tells me to tear it down? So a lot of times you need to find a buyer. So first off, you can't really give it value, okay? It has intrinsic value because most buyers do want those things. But in the appraisal world, it doesn't add a lot of value. And in some, it actually detracts value. And sometimes the, the guidelines are changing, but for years, if you had a converted garage, the appraiser would have to make what's called a cost to cure adjustment. So to convert that back to a typical two car garage, maybe a thousand bucks, 5,000 bucks, depending on what it is. So sometimes it would negate it, but the guidelines are changing now to where if it's done in a workmanlike manner, if it doesn't, violate zoning, you know, but say it's uh, converted to a rec room, then you can kind of say, well, you know, they got covered parking, it's got a rec room, you can kind of sometimes give it value, you just can't include it with your GLA, but it's still a super gray area. Every appraiser does it differently, and every lender looks at it differently. And that's the, like I did an appraisal last month, where they had a converted garage, an extra structure on the property, all these different things, and the lender was asking me to include it as a gross living area, which is the actual inside of the home. And I said, no, it's detached and it's, you know, it's not part of the house because if you walk out your bedroom of your converter garage, you're not walking into the kitchen. You know, you're walking into the backyard. So you don't include it as living area. I've seen it on a lot of MLS listings. We're like, oh, it's 2,000 square feet, you know, but 700 square feet is a detached converter garage. You shouldn't include that and you shouldn't try and give that value because it, it never really will work out. Because the appraiser is going to come and go, all right, so you're a 1,600 square foot house and you got a converted garage, basically. And they'll try and their best to appraise just the house and not the converted garage. And hopefully they'll, they'll try and make it work without touching that, without mentioning it, with just trying to keep it as away from the underwriters as possible because it always comes up as a flag. If you have a kitchen, 
Odds are um, they're going to have to remove the stove so when, you, when the appraiser comes. He's going to say, oh, it's considered a second unit. It's got a stove, you know. I've had before where I've had to have the stove removed um, and the upper cabinets removed. I called FHA and they said, well, if you remove the upper cabinets, now it's considered a wet bar. And they let it slide with that. So it's always a little gray, but typically you always want to take out the stove and then see what shakes out. You know, so stove and then maybe slide the fridge away so they don't see that or, you know, move it out of the way. It's usually one way to get around it. Next thing I wanted to bring up was a lot of times we get FHA offers. You know, you get an FHA offer on a property. If the house is nice, I wouldn't even worry about it. No big deal. <laughs> if your house has deferred maintenance where there's peeling paint, Maybe some of the appliances don't work. Um, the roof might look a little shifty. I know, you know, Brian and I had one of those where the roof was looking a little worn, but it wasn't leaking. If you have an FHA offer and you have water stains in your house, odds are the appraiser is gonna call that out. And what he's gonna say or she's gonna say is, hey, there's water stains, the roof's looking a little old, uh, looking a little worn, I need to get a roof cert on this property. Because what the appraiser is trying to do is limit his liability and say, you know, because the appraiser here on this first page right here, this is basically kind of a brief outline of what an appraiser is looking for in an FHA appraisal. Their main concern is the health and safety of the home, okay? Um, the way, you know, the way it presents itself. The whole thing is you don't want little Timmy or Bob and Cindy getting hurt by grabbing a handrail and falling over if the handrail's loose. Um, they want to make sure that the smoke detector is carbon monoxide, water heater strapped. Um, but the one thing that I've seen the most on FHA appraisals in my years of experience is peeling paint. That's usually the number one thing that gets called out on an appraisal um, is peeling paint. Usually you'll see it on the windowsills, the fascia boards on the seal, on the attic, or not on the attic, but on the, the, by the roof line. Anywhere where there's peeling paint, you'll probably, you know, have that come up in an FHA appraisal because that's something that the appraiser has to call out because if a house is built before 1978, there could be lead-based paint. If there's peeling paint and little Timmy eats a paint chip, now he's eating lead-based paint. So what they ask you to do is to scrape it off, prime it, and paint it. And that usually will solve that problem. But that's the most common one. Well, every appraiser kind of makes up their own rules a little. The FHA gives them guidelines of what to, what to follow, but usually it comes down to the appraiser as, you know, because basically a whole appraisal is subjective. From comps to adjustments to condition, it's all very subjective on the, on the eyes of the, of the appraiser. Some appraisers will come out, open up every window, making sure that they all open and close, because if a window doesn't open, it could be a safety hazard, say it's in a bedroom. Or if you open it, that piece of glass is going to break out. Now you can't climb out because you'll cut yourself. That's a safety hazard. So it's kind of on a case-by-case -case basis. But if you see broken glass or windows don't open, say they've been painted shut, if you have an FHA offer, you might want to tell the seller, hey, we want to make sure these windows are at least operational, you know, that they'll open and close. They don't have to be great. They don't have to be, they can make as much noise as possible, but they just need to be able to open and close. Um, same goes for appliances. If the house has built-in appliances, say a cooktop, built-in ovens, things of that nature, things that can't just be removed like, and can be considered personal property, if they're built-in, they need to work. Okay? And that goes all the way down to pool equipment. A lot of times if the appraiser wants to be a pain in the butt, if the pool's green, they're going to call it the green pool. If they can't turn on the motor or the motor's missing, they're gonna call it out, you know, typically. I've called it out when you walk out and you go, okay, here's the pool equipment. Where's, why are there just pipes? You know, because in FHA's eyes, if the mechanical systems aren't operational, they want them operational, which can, pool equipment kind of sucks because some sellers are like, seriously, we've never used the heater, it's missing or whatever. But typically, if you see those things missing, <clears throat> you're probably going to want, one, you're probably going to get a request for repairs for it. Um, but two, if they could just button it up so it looks like it's working. Most of the time, appraisers aren't going to check a lot of things. They're not going to go test things. If they do, does it turn on? Yes. 
that's great. They're not gonna really check things. The only things they do really check, heater. You need to make sure that the house has heat. Um, typically it has to stay above 50 degrees, 55 degrees to be considered habitable. So the heater needs to work. That's, that has to work. So heater, AC should turn on. They're not gonna go out there and check to make sure it cools really well. But if there's an AC unit, the AC's gotta be able to turn on. Um, the lead-based paint, um, and then the roof. The roof, if there's water stains, a lot of times, you know, I had one, an FHA deal two months ago, and we thought the roof was okay. Then it rained, a freak little rainstorm. I walk in, there's a giant stain in the bedroom, in the master bedroom. I'm like, oh my God. So I called the buyer's agent, um, and I took a photo of it, and I said, hey, you know what? And I had Nico, one of our roofing guys, go out, find the leak in that area, he sealed it up, and then I took photos of it and I sent it over to the buyers and I said, hey, you know, we know the roof needs some work, but I'm gonna, we're gonna paint over this stain before the appraiser comes out so he doesn't call out a roof cert for the whole entire thing. You know, now, don't do that unless, the buyer, unless both parties are aware, um, but you wanna get rid of those issues before the appraiser comes out. And that's for FHA and also conventional, because anytime the roof looks bad and there's leaks and there's a loan, typically the lender's gonna want the property to at least have a roof. And so if you look at the next page that I brought in here, this is the second page of the appraisal and it's called the comparable grid, okay? And this is what appraisers use to figure out what properties are worth. So if you look at the top, this property that I appraised was at 433 West Valencia. Um, three comps that I used, comp one, comp two, and comp three, um, they range from 651 to 850. Okay, so it's a pretty big spread as far as comps. But they're all kind of similar as far as they're all within 20%, all within a similar neighborhood, and um, most had the same bedroom count. But so the main things that the appraisers adjust on, typically default lot size. It's pretty much all the stuff that's highlighted. Lot size, bed and bath count, um, gross living area, uh, garages, fireplaces, those kinds of things. We, you know, th those are the main ones, okay? Um, typically a lot of appraisers won't even adjust for a bedroom unless, there's a, unless the market shows it. So like a lot of times a three and a four bedroom doesn't really change things unless it's in an area where you can look at it and go, well, four bedrooms are selling for 700,000 and three bedrooms are selling for 650. Okay, then you're gonna need to make an adjustment. In a lot of areas in the valley, it doesn't really matter. Three and four is just, they're interchangeable a lot of times. So it really depends on the neighborhood. So like in this one in Burbank, um, comp one was a two bedroom, one bath. So I added $10,000 for the bedroom and I added $10,000 for the bathroom. So it's 20,000 up, and then you do a square footage adjustment. And the square footage adjustment is the most confusing thing for realtors to figure out because most realtors go, well, if, it, if it's selling, at, you know, if everything's at 500 a square foot and I'm 200 feet bigger, then I should take, you know, $500, $500 times 200, and that would be my, what, what I'm worth. But that's not really the case because your buyers, if something's 100 feet bigger, are they really gonna pay an extra $25,000 for 100 square feet? Most won't, because 100 square feet is half a bedroom or a bedroom, or it's a bigger living room, but a lot of times it's not a you know, cost per square foot kind of thing. So most appraisers, when they adjust for square footage, they adjust it based on what the market, what a buyer would perceive as an adjustment. There's no real definitive, here's how you calculate the cost per square foot adjustment. Usually what I do, and it's worked for 10 years, most underwriters are fine with it, and now the, these days, appraisals get compared to your peers. So at Fannie and Freddie look at every appraisal done in an area. If you have adjustments that are totally different than every other appraiser out there, you, you get flagged and have to go back and defend your work. So I haven't had that happen yet. So this is basically my rule of thumb and you guys can kind of go with it. It's a little easier. Say on average, everything is going for say $500 a square foot, okay, for on average. 
Usually what I do is I divide it by four. So if everything's selling for $500 a square foot and I wanna figure out how to make an adjustment for square footage, usually what I would do is I would take that 500 and divide it by four. So you get 125. And then you would, if you look down here, if you look at the line that has all the square footage, you'll see how it's highlighted 1721 is us. And then you have 1432, 1416 and 1732. So what I did on this one is I took $100 a square foot. So I multiplied, you know, whatever 1721 minus 1432 is, and then multiply that by 100, okay? So it was actually 289 feet smaller. So it's 289 times 100. Because if I did 289 times 500, you know, the cost per square foot, I'd get some crazy number that would totally overinflate what a buyer would perceive paying an extra, you know, 289 square feet for. So it's kind of a very confusing thing to figure out. Um, but that's basically what I've done is always just divide it by four and, and multiply that part out. Do you guys kind of get that or is it totally confusing? Can you just repeat that one more? Sure. So let's just look at comp one. If you look at comp one, you'll see how that property is 1,432 square feet, okay? And we're 1,721 square feet, okay? So we're trying to figure out how much of an adjustment would we make for that difference in size, okay? So what you do is first you go, well, that one's 289 feet smaller than us. So you know that you're bigger, you're 289 feet larger, okay? So you know the square footage difference. Then what you need to figure out is, well, what am I gonna, how am I gonna figure out what I'm gonna adjust? You know, how do I actually give it a number? And what I usually do is, if you look at all your comps, say, uh, when you have, you know when you run your comps, and you have all your comps in like the one line item on the MLS, and you can see the square foot, and the cost per square foot there, and you go, okay, well these are my comps. And say you have 10 and they're roughly between say 500 and 600 a square foot. You know, you go, okay, what's the average? Say so the average is 550. So then I would take 550 and divide it by four. And say that, say that number was 125. So that's my, that would be what I'm gonna adjust the comparable. So I would take. Why you divide it by four? Because it's, you wanna find a number that one underwriters will accept and what buyers usually perceive, okay? I always divide by four on the square footage because it's just over the years I've just noticed that it's always kind of that what, what works out after doing about 2,000 appraisals yeah. and going well when I adjust it all my numbers kind of m match up and yeah it's yeah it's the money factor yeah it's the square footage money factor you know so yeah so yeah I just kind of divide by four and, But yeah, so and when you, when you meet the appraiser, ha, never, never, ever, ever say, are we going to be good on value? Never say that, because the first thing they're going to go is, well, what's wrong with the value? You know, and they're going to look in their head and they're going to find everything that, why is, this, why is this realtor stressed out about the value of my home? If you walk in there and you own it, you go, man, this place is great. Here's a list of the upgrades. Um, you know, and then inflate their ego a little, say, I know you know what you're doing, I know you know the neighborhood. I did bring some comps, and usually, if you just hand them comps, they might not even look at them. But if you go, hey, there's a couple things, I've seen all these comps before, especially if you're in Burbank and you've been in them or you've sold them or you think something's weird about them, feel free to point it out because the appraiser doesn't go on caravan. The appraiser doesn't go inside the comp. So if there's a comp that hurts you and is not good, find something wrong with it, you know? Go, it's got a funky floor plan. You know what, it was on the market for 100 days. You know, whatever you can help the appraiser so he doesn't have to, one, use that comp, or two, he can use it, make an adjustment for, it was wackadoodle, the tile was crooked everywhere, the laminate flooring was just, smelled like urine, whatever it is, tell them because they don't know. And they're not going to call the realtor and be like, so what was wrong with your place? I mean, I have, when I was like, what? This place looks great. What is wrong with it? And I finally called the guy. I'm like, dude, why would you sell your place so cheap? And he's like, well, you couldn't get to the backyard and this bedroom was funky. And I was like, oh, cool. And then I was able to make an adjustment for that to make the deal I was working on work because mine made sense except for this comp. So you want to really play it up.